The spring has come. The earth has received the embrace. Strangely enough, they have a mind to till the soil. Whatever you do, day. These people have made many rules that overrun its banks and is not to melt the trail and pay to the ocean. So, it's uh, so what, what all that all land that was once blood 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 by his children. Did you? Yeah. What's the name of Randy? So we tell what we got coming up in about five minutes. We're going to have a few things back. We're going to have a few things back. We're going to have a few things back. Uh, and that's going to be right here at the. I don't even know. You know, there's like. Oh, when. You know, it's. Yeah. You know, it's. 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 Yay! Anybody out there? Ah, uh, shop at Good Earth. Yay! Anybody out there belong to the Marine Agricultural Land Trust? Yay! Anybody shop at the farmers market? Yay! Eat Strauss products? Yay! Good job. Um, welcome to the Sustainable um, Agriculture and Marin County Panel. I'm Constance Washburn from the Marine Agricultural Land Trust. And here to talk today about some of the challenges and opportunities facing a sustainable food system for Marin County in the future. We have a great panel who I'll introduce in a minute. But what I wanted to say is that Marin is, real, is small. We have 276 farms in Marin County. And, but we're a giant in terms of sustainable agriculture leading the way in the nation. We had um, our farmers markets led the resurgence of farmers markets in the country. We have model organic farms. We have the oldest California organic farm in the country. Um, Warren Weber, Star Out Farms. And we have the oldest agricultural land trust in the country, which is malt. And we have the Strauss Family Creamery, which is the first organic creamery south of the, no, west of the Mississippi. South, west, north. And so given all of that and all the, um, the amazing resources Marin have, we probably still, and Steve Quirt's back over there and will argue with me, but only have one or two percent of all the food that's in the county um, that's actually from the county. That all people, one or two percent of the food that's eaten in this county and bought in this county is actually grown here. So we really have a long way to go in terms of building a local food system. And part of the problem is we have this national food system that is really geared towards shipping food from one end of the planet to the other. We have, I'm gonna give everybody a little lecture on the farm bill just quickly, uh, because it's so important and it's in Congress right now. So what you want, that farm bill really defines the way we eat in this country. It supports corn and soybean production that are going into high fructose corn syrup and highly processed foods. It defines what our kids eat in school. So if we want to move our food system, if we want to move a food system for the nation that's healthy, we really have to address policies on the federal level. So now is the time to call your representative in Washington and tell them that you want the Farm Bill to support nutrition, to support local food systems and to support conservation. Those are the primary messages you want to get across. And it's really important because that bill affects so much of what we eat. So it's a really important thing to do. So I wanted to introduce our fabulous panelists this evening and we're gonna challenges that they're facing to build a sustainable food system in uh, Marin County. And there's the economic challenges, there's the environmental challenges, and um, then we'll talk about the opportunities. How is it we're going to grow a sustainable food system? Because if it can't be done here, we're just going to set the model for the nation and say, yes, we're going to do it. So we have first Vivian Strauss. Yay! Strauss, from, who was born 
in the Strauss family in Tamales, Tamal, um, Strauss Family Creamery. She ran away to LA to become an actress, but she's home. <laughs> and we're glad she is. She works for um, Cowgo Creamery, which uses Strauss milk to create cheese. A cheese map from Marin and Sonoma. And then we have Aaron Lander from Marin Sun Farms, who grew up in the Midwest surrounded by all the GMO corn and soybeans and escaped to Marin County and he's working for Marin Sun Farms which is direct marketing grass-fed beef and has really been a leader in grass-fed beef production um, in Marin but also really led the way, way countywide. And we have Leah Smith, yay, who um, works as the program director for the Agricultural Institute of Marin, otherwise known as the Marin Farmers Market. And Leah was started the Marin Food Systems Project and worked on the Marin Food Policy Council and also worked for Malt with me for many years. And next to her we have Peter Martinelli, who's a farmer from Bolinas, Fresh Run Farms, excellent vegetable grower, and was on what, the founding board of Marin Organic, was the found, one of the founders of Marin Organic, and is currently on the Marin Agricultural Land Trust Board. And I think what we all need to give Peter a huge round of applause for is that Peter really worked recently to develop an apprenticeship program that's made apprenticing legal on organic farms and that's been just maybe I'll talk a little bit more about that but I don't know if people know how huge that is but it's really great and Mark Squire um, was one of the owners of Good Earth Natural Foods in Fairfax which has moved to a new very fancy store and Mark's been very involved with organic certification and anti-GMOs around Marin and the country. So thank you, Mark, for all that. Anything I left out? That's enough. This is Laurie Grace, I'm Executive Director of the Sunshine Center, Sunrise, sorry, um, who's working for a greener future, um, working um, anti-GMOs, and also working very hard to on sustainability, sustainability issues around Marin County. So thank you, Lori, for being here. Yay. So um, the first question is the, just to talk about the challenges, maybe the economic challenges, the environmental challenges that you're facing um, to build a sustainable future for agriculture in one county. So I'm starting with Vivian. Oh, I'm, uh, the order I'm going in is the order of agriculture in Marin County. So dairy is our primary agricultural industry. So we're starting with the dairy representative. A representative, not a farmer, just to let you know. <laughs> Clarify that. I grew up on the dairy. Um, I just have to say that I'd say the biggest problem that dairy farmers have is the cost of feed. Um, and uh, that's 40 to 60 percent of the cost of production is the feed. So with all these, uh, with the ethanol um, and other issues, the, the feed is, is, is expensive. Farmers, dairy farmers do not get paid the cost of production. So uh, the price of milk is set in Chicago, if you can believe it, and it will fluctuate. This is on the conventional market. It will fluctuate from month to month. So uh, for many, many decades, uh, dairy farmers have been going out of business at a rate of 5% a year, and that's across the nation. So when I grew up in the, in the 60s, there were 200 farms in Marin. Dairy farms are now uh, in the 20s, and it, so it's been a real struggle. Um, so maybe I should, should I talk about some of the things we've been doing? So some of the things that have happened is, is that the dairies are converting to organic. So about half the dairies in, in Marin are actually converting to, have converted to organic, which is great, because organic actually pays the cost of production. So organic milk may cost more in the store, because, but that's because that's how much it costs to, to buy the feed and to pay people a living wage and et cetera, et cetera. So it's actually been a really a big saving grace for farms. The other thing that's happened is that people are doing direct marketing, on-farm sales, uh, and cheese making, which is just burgeoning in the Sonoma Marin area. So we just had a couple of them uh, a few years ago. We now have almost 30 cheese makers in Sonoma and Marin. I'm, there's about eight, I think, in Marin itself, but um, we kind of lump ourselves together because we all work together. But that's um, something that's really helped because cheese makers, when you have a value-added product, you can uh, you can sell your milk for a little bit more money. So, oh, I think you want me to talk about malt? Yes. Yes. So, malt, great thing. What happened, what malt has done is it buys, uh, I don't know how many of you know, some of you are members of malt, so you probably know that you 
get a chunk of cash for selling your rights to develop your farm and you take that cash and you can do many things and for Strauss Family Creamery it was used to help make the transition to organic um, for so for without malt we could not have done it um, help pay for the increased cost of feed and um, and and to build our processing plant so uh, it is a saving grace for many many farmers and uh, I don't know what we do without it and it has allowed my siblings and I to be able to stay on the farm without losing our farm to inheritance taxes as well when my parents died so okay, thank you Vivian um, I just wanted to say one of the biggest challenges that farming in Marin County faces is the cost of land. Um, you know, Marin County is a fairly popular place to live. It's really beautiful. So the cost of land for a farmer to keep their land or inherit land is really, really high. So that's where malt comes in. So our second um, highest in, um, agricultural industry in Marin is beef. So um, Aaron will talk about the the challenges that they're facing with Marin's... Hey, let me lick this thing. <laughs> okay, so the biggest thing is um, with raising beef is it takes a lot longer uh, to actually do it. So it costs more money overall because instead of uh, taking 18 months on corn fed, it takes 26 to 30 months on grass fed. So it takes a much longer time for us to do this uh, process. And so... Uh, we need more financial capital to be able to do this and grow. And as we're trying to change the way people eat and view food, the biggest problem is having access to the financial capital because all the profits go into expanding and expanding and expanding. And so one of the things that's really awesome for uh, private consumers to do is to invest into CSA programs because that helps farms grow and helps build more educational outreach opportunities because as farmers it's the biggest problem is people don't know these issues and don't have access to it overall and so the CSA program at least for Marin Sum Farms is providing more access to more people including low-income families and uh, uh, youth groups and community groups all over the bay so that they are, get more connected to where their food's coming from and just don't take it as oh yeah we have this and we're going to want it all the time. So uh, basically it's access to the market and the, the production aspect of raising animals is a lot more economically, uh, an economic burden to us than uh, the corn production. So to change that, getting involved with the CSA, doing other things, getting involved with community outreach and just taking a big step. And it's all about us in Marin County being able to do these things because we're going to be the people that other regions around the country are going to model themselves off of and if we can do it right here it's going to change the way that people eat all over the country so great thank you um yeah i mean if the direct marketed beef and and vegetable products here are competing you're competing with a billion dollar advertising industry selling mcdonald's and taco bell and skittles so changing and marketing and educating our public is so important to eat local and to eat other food. So I'm going to go to Peter next, who will represent vegetables. And Veg Vedo, what, what are organic vegetable farmers facing? In an economy of scale, and until you get large enough, you have to generate, it's hard to generate enough extra uh, profit to, to, um, to make it here. And, and because we're limited in size and scope, I would say, um, as far as uh, you know, the things I'm thinking of are the cost of labor is pretty high here, um, and we, and, and in our case, we pay a, above a minimum wage. We've tried to pay a fair wage, and uh, the cost of bringing in inputs. Um, we're not uh, for vegetable farming. We're not considered a vegetable region. We're considered a, a grass and a dairy region, and there aren't a lot of suppliers, and you have to pay to ship stuff in from far away, from. The nearest place I go for supplies, I have to go to Santa Rosa. Um, unlike, say, I, if I were in the Sacramento County or something, I might go five miles to get what I need. Um, also, the um, the just the, the 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 cost of these things and being in, in the higher fuel because we're in the Bay Area and the economy is a little richer and the cost of fuel. If you always hear the gas reports, they say, well, you know, the the, the medium price in the United States is uh, four dollars a gallon and go down the street and it's like 450 in Marin County or San Francisco and it's, we've got to pay all those prices too and try to produce food and so the other thing is regulation to go along with that high cost is the time it takes to deal with regulation we have intense amount of environmental regulation because we are a very 
coveted area and there is a robust environmentalist community around the Bay Area and particularly in Marin. There are a great many regulations and things that in other parts of California haven't even been thought of that we have to deal with and comply with and also within agriculture and food and safety which are very important regulations but there are also layers of regulation that we have to deal with, take time to pay fees, take time to do paperwork. So they're just layers of complication and expense and challenge to that is that the people we're selling against, as producers in Marin and being small producers, the people we're selling against are dealing in economies that may be 100 miles or even 50 miles away from here, that are, all of these things are less. You know, the, the materials are easy to get, the regulation, there are fewer regulations, the cost of fuel, the cost of labor, the cost of these things is lower, and we have to compete in a marketplace where these guys are coming in uh, with lower costs. So to deal with that, um, at least in, in my work, I have found that the best way to deal with that and, and try to get more return for the product we produce is to get closer to you, the consumer, um, whether it's through farmer's market or uh, selling out of uh, local neighborhood stands or selling to local retailers such as Good Earth um, and try to, try to eliminate the middleman and not ship the product down to San Francisco to the wholesale market and get a, a lower return. So that's sort of the way we try to deal with it is, is to, to, to to bring in that higher price and get that, that middle middle person cream, so. Right, thanks, Peter. So we're gonna talk to a middle person. <laughs> small. <laughs> small middle person. Um, Leah Smith of the Agricultural Institute of Marin who runs the farmer's markets. Just a, a little bit of a statistic. Um, if you buy local food, you're using something like 17 times less greenhouse gas gases than if you buy from the grocery store, huge way to reduce your carbon footprint. Agricultural Institute of Marin is a 28-year-old organization. We started the first farmer's market in Marin County here at the Civic Center. And um, I imagine a lot of you have been there um, by the hands that were raised. Um, we also run a total of eight farmer's markets in the Bay Area, um, four of which are in Marin, the two at the Civic Center on Thursday and Sunday, Novato, Fairfax, and then um, three in Alameda County and one in San Francisco. And we work with a total of 200 farmers, certified producers, that are in the greater Bay Area region um, within approximately 150 mile radius of this area. And what we're, our mission, um, we're a nonprofit organization, is to really help small to mid-sized producers in the greater Bay Area region in the state of California to be viable, to, to create a venue and an outlet for them to sell directly to consumers. And so that's what we've been doing for the last 28 years. And um, a majority of our producers, if you look at the breakdown, who are, make up that 200 um, farmer number, um, most of them come, the top, largest number come from Sonoma, and then the second is from Marin. And that has to do with what Peter was just talking about, is that we don't have as many vegetable producers in Marin County because of the nature of the landscape. And more and more dairy and meat producers are actually going into direct marketing. And it's a huge trend, and it's wonderful, because now you all can buy direct from producers um, your, your dairy and your meat products as well. But certified farmers markets, I just want to distinguish that really quickly because there's a lot of confusion. Um, the term farmers market um, has a lot of cachet and it's used um, to market various things. And what a certified farmers market is, is that the producers in the market have been certified. It's been verified that they are selling you what they grew themselves. And that's really important. Um, you know, grocery stores sometimes use this term. So that's one of the challenges that we face is um, dealing with um, kind of misrepresentation of what, um, what uh, of, of the term farmer's markets. is known and um, one of the most important pieces of legislation that's um, on the table right now is called the Local Food, Farms and Jobs Act. And um, just to, to get yourself more aware of that piece of legislation and to weigh in on it and encourage your representatives to support it. Great, thank you, Leah. Um, one of the another little tidbits, the USDA, which is um, responsible for the Farm Bill, recommends that we all eat nine servings of fruits and vegetables every day, right? Yeah, and everybody doing that? Yes, yeah, nodding heads. But most, 99% uh, of the money in the food bill goes to the products that will support Coca-Cola and Doritos. So, Mark, Squire. Hello. I, I wanted to. Uh, they said they could hear. Yeah. You know, I think I wanted to talk as I listen to these folks who uh, 
you know, you keep hearing sort of the economics come up as a block uh, to uh, truly sustainable and local agriculture. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of times the piece that's missing from that conversation is that, you know, these guys are producing a, a product that is so vastly superior than anything else on the market that, you know, it, it's, to me, it's hard to compare, you know, it's like apples and oranges comparing that. and. You know, I, I keep going back to uh, one of my great heroes is Rachel Carson, and uh, you know she was very, one of the to me one of the greatest things that she articulated was that um, the idea that we and our environment are not different from each other, and as as soon as you start thinking of our environment as an other or something that we need to control or or run or whatever immediately uh, many problems arise in that model and uh, you know I think all these producers at this table are people that are demonstrating that you know they are part of their environment they're part of Marin County you know you part of the product they're producing is not only vastly superior nutritional food but it's also the environment we live in you know it's like you couldn't have um, uh, the pristine environment that we live in Marin County without all our organic agriculture if you if you simply removed all our organic producers from the county and put conventional producers in their place you would literally be inhaling pesticides that were blowing over this mountain every day and our kids would be you know, you could demonstrate that there was more pesticides in our children's bloodstreams as a result of that. So it's like I kind of am quick to kind of say, well, wait a minute, the, you know, we're, we're talking about a whole different system here. And even to, you know, when people kind of start saying, well, your food is more expensive than the food at McDonald's, it's like, it, it's not even a fair comparison. And uh, I think it's a really important for all of us to remember that. Part of what we're supporting when we support Malt or we support the Strauss Creamery or um, Martinelli Farm is we're actually supporting uh, you know, people that are cooperatively making our environment of Marin into a, a healthy place for our kids to grow up. And you know, to me, it's that's there's no money that could even touch that. So. Uh, I think that's the main thing I wanted to say and you know I, I think another uh, if I may also introduce as a, a, a little bit of a middle middleman in the picture you know we uh, Good Earth actually produces a lot of food uh, manufactures a lot of food so we get Peter's uh, vegetables in and uh, we uh, turn it into our uh, basil pesto or whatever and uh, you know we actually in this new store we invested way more in our kitchen operation than all the experts said we should have ever done because uh, <laughs> grocery stores just don't do that is what we were told but uh, and part of that is I think you know another piece in the supporting local equation is about supporting local food producers too because immediately if uh, you know if Good Earth is making you know turning agricultural products into a, a, a sandwich you know you're eliminating packaging you're eliminating miles in that equation just as you are by buying local food products uh, and you know, cooking them in your own kitchen too so uh, great that's Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's um, the food has to be eaten, so it's really supporting the people who are using the products either to sell at their stores or to make food out of is also fabulous. So, Lori. So, I'm the executive director of Sunrise Center, and we have, uh, I have a uh, certified organic um, farm and retreat center in Maui, which teaches uh, people how to do organic farming and permaculture and works with woofers. Um, I, went, I have a passion for education both here in Marin, where we have a center in Corte Madera running classes in green lifestyle change and sprouting and different things about container gardening or other things, but um, I, uh, I was first uh, starting to be alarmed when I sought to create an organic uh, educational program at the University of Hawaii in, in Maui, and I kept on getting a runaround. And the reason that I discovered that was because Monsanto, as it does in all other agricultural 
uh, universities in the United States has uh, deciding uh, has the money to basically control them. And then whenever there's a professor who has studied something that challenges GMOs or Roundup or anything, the professor either gets fired or if the professor is um, is a um, retired and working professor emeritus, they will not be allowed to publish in the United States. And so I'm very alarmed at um, how can Americans make intelligent decisions about their food if they don't have any information. And I would like to say to you, after doing the research I've done now on GMOs, including myself, you know, about, you have about 10% of what you need to know about genetically modified foods. And that's one of the reasons I support the labeling, just on the simple basis of people knowing what they're eating. But when I began to study this and discover information that was being suppressed from all of us here in the United States, information that you will not find in newspapers, I was horrified. For example, when I talked to a Dr. Don Huber, um, and I've now had extensive con discussions with him, there is a, a new organism that has shown up on GMO corn and soy fields and now alfalfa that is as small as the smallest virus, uh, replicates rapidly like a bacteria, um, is highly infectious and can't be killed by ordinary means. It can be found in dairy, it can be found in eggs, it can be found in fish that are fish farmed with uh, GMO soy and corn, it can be found in milk and cheese, and, and also it causes major disease in plants and also infertility and miscarriages in animals and humans, as well as chronic fatigue-like symptoms, irritable bowel syndromes, and autism-type symptoms. And this thing cannot be killed. It's much like a prion, but it's not a prion, and it's not a bacteria, and it's not a virus. This man has been studying this. He tried to tell Obama not to make GMO alfalfa legal, and uh, Vilsack, the head of the USDA, just dismissed it. And, and uh, now we have this organism proliferating and can just be eaten. You can scramble an egg, eat it, or go to a restaurant and eat a non-organic egg, eat it, and it can live in your intestines as we speak. So that was horrifying to me. Like a prion, it can't be killed. And so I have got, decided to go on a campaign of education, and I know that I'm at some risk. I just talked to uh, a woman who was uh, blackballed by Monsanto, and investigated in Monsanto has hired Blackwater. So anyway, I, I just wanted to speak to that, and my, the other thing that I think is wonderful is really supporting anything organic. And even if the farmer can't support, can't pay for all the organic certification because they don't, they're raising the prices of that so that they can push out the small farmers on a certain level. Um, I think going to your farmer's market and asking if things have been non-sprayed and they don't use uh, artificial fertilizers and also they don't use Roundup is a really good choice. So, um, all right. That's what I'm about. Great, thank you. So now we've heard quite a bit of bad news. There's also good news. Um, in Marin County. Opposition. <laughs> yes, we have. What? Proposition to label right. genetically modified foods. All right, so tell them about that. All right. You're going to have a chance to make a historic step in here in the United States. If we can pass this proposition to label genetically modified foods, you'll actually be able to tell, and it's proliferated in so many things. Like, how many of you know that most vitamin C is made from GMO corn? Raise your hand. <laughs> is that shocking? It was shocking to me. <laughs> Even a laser with emergency health packets. So, I mean, I just, you know, I just really, needed to add that. That's the action step this November. Great, thank you. So, um, 
what the, the power of people eating local and the power of people developing um, organic products and value-added products is helping us build a sustainable future. So let Vivian talk a little bit about what Cowgirl Creamery has done. So that's one of the things that I talked about earlier is the fact that there are now 30 cheesemakers and I just two in the last couple of months came in. I just talked to one yesterday. It's a new one. Um, so there are, uh, like I said, that's that's happy, helping. 70% of those cheesemakers are farmers, which is also wonderful. So it's, it is helping everyone. So that's one of the things. Um, I know that one of the things that my brother is doing, um, which ties into what uh, was just said about GMOs, is he's got a non-GMO verification um, program going on in the dairy, which is the only, I think, organic dairy in the U.S. that is non-GMO certified. Because he brought in organic feeds for the cows and found out they were contaminated with GMOs, which uh, like 60 or 70 percent. So it's a little frightening. And he said, OK, I'm going to verify every ingredient that I use that it's non-GMO certified. And he goes right back to it. So that's something that's happening. Um, and, and for any other reason, if you don't understand or want to know, or don't understand any of the health risks and the rest of it, think of it this way. They say that GMOs crops don't use, um, say that they're using less pesticides. We all know that's not true. And we are contaminating the groundwater and the rivers so that there are dead zones in the ocean and we're hurting ourselves in many ways. Okay, anyway, um, one of the, so we're doing the, um, I don't know, this is, this is the cheese makers. I was also going to say the Cowgirl Creamery, which, which is an example of uh, a cheese maker who's not a farmer buying from local farms. There, there are those that are not farmers. Um, they have solar paneling on their, uh, on the barn in Point Reyes, which is playing, which is playing a big part in saving electricity. In my brother's dairy, we have a, a, a methane digester that keeps methane out of the atmosphere. Um, and reducing greenhouse gases and it powers the dairy, powers 70 to uh, 80 percent of the water that we use for cleaning, and uh, it heats it and reduces fecal coliform and BODs. So, um, and then also, I just want to say there's also malt, which has uh, and other agencies like Marin RCD and Spawn and NRCS, which have helped a lot of us dairies, including ours. Um, fence off streams and help with erosion control so that we're protecting the water. So that's another thing that's been really, really helpful. Great. Erin? B, the, one of the things that um, maybe you can talk about is how organic um, beef production, rotation grazing is actually a benefit to the environment. A lot, we think of agriculture as being the enemy for the environment and actually can be an incredible um, facilitator of healthy water and um, good grasses managed properly. So that's one of the things that um, Marin Sun Farms is doing. <laughs> yes, uh, I want to start off by just saying that we are not organic certified and we do that for a reason. Um, the organic labeling is more of a marketing tool in the beef industry where you can have beef be raised using organic practices, though it's not anywhere close to what we're doing on our farms at all. You can feed them organic soy and organic corn, and it still is organic, though it's not its natural way of being raised. And so what we're doing is trying to redefine those words and terminologies. And so instead of 100% organic beef, we want to be 100% grass-fed and pasture-raised, where you know exactly what you're buying and what is happening versus being kind of deceived to being just comfortable going up and picking up an organic uh, sticker because you we were being taught to be able to do that and so uh, that's one thing that I wanted to bring up the, the the way that we raise our animals though is really incredible the the whole pasture rotation our cows are out there they move in paddocks which are just the areas of pastures that they're occupying uh, Farmers since the 1900s have been perfecting the system, and now you can raise enough animals in this fashion to feed the entire country if we just had the land capability to do so and not the big interest groups. And so uh, what, our, what happens is our cows move from one paddock to an, another after each week. Um, they do their thing in the paddock, and then after they leave, that paddock goes into a state of rest and recovery. The, the chickens then come through on that paddock and spread out the manure, eat all the bugs, act as a form of pest control, and uh, add more quality to the soil when the cows come in the next time. So after each pasture, or 
paddock to pasture is rotated, it's that much more fertile, which is even better. Uh, and so the meat is even better for you because it's higher in omega-3s, lower in omega-6s. Corn-fed meat is, uh, the ratio to omega-3s to 6s is anywhere from 1 to 20 to 1 to 60. Our bodies need 1 to 1, whereas grass-fed is about 1 to 3 to 1 to 4. So there's a significant difference in that. Uh, there's more CLA fatty acids. Um, there's, uh, it's easier to digest because if you think about the animals uh, being able to digest their natural diet, that means that uh, the fat that they're producing is a natural fat. If they're fed corn, which their bodies can't produce because, or digest because they have multiple stomachs and that since they're not like humans, uh, then it turns into bad fat onto them and then when we eat it, it's bad fat on us. And it, that's just the reality of the reality of it. Um, that whole process for the environment uh, helps reduce the, our carbon footprint because they're just out there on open pastures. There's not a lot of methane, uh, which is what uh, Vivian has to deal with, which is why they have uh, the, the methane com uh, digester. digester is uh, when you have to raise cows in barns, there's a lot of methane, and that's the, one of the main reasons why uh, uh, industrial agriculture is really bad for the environment is there's all this waste product which the farmers uh, have to pay to uh, get rid of and the, it's not put onto the consumer so you're supporting negative uh, environmental impacts and that waste has to be transported to another area or whatnot and so uh, the, the methane is completely irrelevant in this point and then uh, we utilize a lot of solar energy because the only thing that is growing the grass that our beef raise or graze on is the sun and the water and the whole dynamics and so you don't get the fur or the chemicals going into the stream going into the bays uh you don't get the the negative impacts all around and when you start to support the local farmers you're not only helping rebuild the local economy you're helping rebuild our local health system because you're not going to get as many sick people you're helping uh lower those other it, you're helping making it more accessible to everybody else and so it's really important to to be able to know exactly where your animals are coming from and how they're raised because it does have a very positive impact on the environment overall great thank you i think that's a really important thing that um the most important thing you can do is know your farmer and really know where your food comes from regardless of labels no check it out who it is how they grow it i um, just wanted to say in terms of grazing land, which is mostly what Marin has, but Marin is 50% grazing land. Our California is 50% grazing land. The world is something like 70% rangeland. And that rangeland, if managed properly, can sequester um, all the carbon we need to sequester by using rotation grazing and composting and using that land in a way that'll sequester carbon so it can help us reduce our greenhouse gases. Um, the other thing to say about rangeland and well-managed agricultural land is that it's home to wildlife. 75% of the wildlife habitat in this country is on farms and ranches. So managing for that habitat, for that wildlife is really important. And that's where Peter comes in. ...that you have with nature that's always going to happen and, and change and improve and there's no, there's no end game. It's a constant thing that I think all agriculture should be engaged in. And uh, in our case, we're in a very uh, beautiful place. We're in on the Bolinas Peninsula, about two miles north of the town, where the, the Inverness Ridge starts to rise up um, and, and make its way northwest towards uh, the tip of Point Reyes. And it's just a gorgeous habitat. Um, we have a second growth duck fir forest to the uh, west and north, and then an oak woodland kind of blends down into that, coming off of Mount Tam and through the Alima Valley. So it's a very mixed habitat, and it's very um, it's very much intact. And we're host to spotted owls and red-legged frogs and coho salmon and a number of uh, interesting species and, and, and um, rare species. And it's a real um, it's a testament to the place. It's not so much a testament to what we do, but that, that, that those things are here and they're here in Marin. They're not just on our farm. And really what it comes down to is um, recognizing that an intact, strong ecosystem is beneficial to agriculture. It's not a danger. You don't have to cut down all the trees and poison all the ditches like they do in some parts of the state and sterilize the landscape. That really when you have an intact ecosystem and you have predator insects and you have 
all the different um, micro life and, and, and mammals and everything there, they, whenever something's a little bit out of balance on the farm, you can almost bet that something's going to come and take care of your problem. And to, to, to the foundation of farming that way really is to start with soil and feeding soil and building a nutrient bank that is in harmony with the location. And the way we do that on our farm is that we, we apply lots of compost. There's really no such thing as enough quality finished compost on an organic farm. And we also uh, grow leguminous cover crops, which is a process some of you might be familiar with. It's a natural way to harvest nitrogen from the air and not have to mine it or buy it in. But doing those things and, and treating the soil not like it's an instant medium, like you throw fertilizer down and you plant and you get your crop in a month or two, but actually you treat it like, uh, I'm gonna put compost in every season. And the compost they put down today, this year, is really not gonna matter this year. It's gonna make more of a difference next year and the year after. And you start to look at the soil and you look at the land in the long view, and you build it and you treat it well that way and it becomes healthy. And you know what I'm talking about. North side of the house probably isn't a great place to put your tomatoes and things like that. But on a farm, you do the same thing. You figure out what naturally thrives in that location and on specific places left location. And once you identify that and you're taking care of healthy soil, and you have a healthy environment, you haven't filled everything off, and you can have ladybugs come in and deal with your acres, and you can count on earthworms being in your soil. That's, that's really what it's about. There's so many things that organic means, but for me, that's really what it's about. Great. Thank you, Peter. And I wanted to um, get Leah to talk a little bit about this initiative, the Healthy Eating Active Living, and that, you know, our eating healthy and from healthy farms is going to make us healthy and build a healthy community. So it's all of us working together towards that. So there's a countywide initiative that Leah will tell a little about. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Marin County right now is in a planning process. Um, called Healthy Eating Active Living Strategic Planning Process and what we're really trying to do is look very kind of holistically and for a long time and I have to give Constance a lot of kudos for this um, we've been trying people who are working in the sustainable ag sector of Marin County have really been trying to educate people in the health sector that the two are intimately connected that if we don't have healthy food and healthy farms we don't have healthy people so um, it's been wonderful to see this is very much embraced in the strategic planning process and so now we're really moving forward to create a vision for Marin County that we're all bought into. The direct service providers, the hospitals, the people who are doing the bike to school programs, that everybody is on the same page that we're moving towards a common goal towards a healthy community that very much involves a healthy local food system. So that's exciting. and. Um, Along those lines, you know, about education, I just wanted to say in terms of opportunities in Marin, we have so many opportunities for education, whether it's directed at kids or directed at adults, and uh, MALT for the last 10 years has had the Farm Field Studies Program, and we have um, field trips at the farmer's market for kids called Dig in the Farmer's Market. I just saw a kid running around with one of the shirts on from our program, um, and, I, and I just want to... And Marin Organic has had the organic. farm to school program and gleaning program. That's right. So, so there's all these great programs in Marin County that that are hoping to educate the next generation and bring about you know the, the next set of voters who are going to vote for sustainable agriculture, the next set of eaters who are going to make decisions to support farmers like the people who are sitting at this table today. Um, so we talked a little bit about the Farm Bill and this um, local uh, Farms Food and Jobs Act and I just wanted to give you a little bit more on that because it's really exciting. There's been um, uh, two uh, legislators, representatives, who have actually put this act before um, Congress and the House of Representatives, and it's, it's the time is now to actually let your representatives know that this is a really important piece of legislation, and what it does is it kind of lines up the kinds of programs that we want to see in the Farm Bill. And so this is what we'd get if we supported the local Farms Food and Jobs Act. It would help farmers and ranchers pool and process their products, and connect to larger regional retail and institutional markets including schools. It would enable schools to use more federal dollars to buy fresh local food. It would expand access to crop and credit insurance for organic producers. 
it would improve the diets of people who are using food stamps. So um, one of the reasons why I'm going to DC next week is because um, there's a bunch of people across the country who have been given um, some funding from the Wholesome Way Foundation to basically demonstrate that incentivizing using food stamps at the farmer's market is a powerful health tool. It's powerful because it supports local farmers and it's powerful because it supports the local economy. And there are farmers like us across the country that are doing this and we're all trying to show with data that, um, that this is a program that um, the federal government should be supporting. So um, all of those things, if you support... Years ago, not, now I'm a wild seaweed harvester in Mendocino County. My, uh, I have a broad-based environmental uh, intention. I'm an independent running on fundamental reform. My first priority is ocean. I'm Norman Solomon, and I bring to the table four decades now of environmental activism research and authorship. I co-founded, I founded actually the Institute for Public Accuracy. In 1998, we immediately began to fight for basic federal action on climate change and global warming before it was fashionable. I understand uh, that deep green has to include being willing to challenge the prerogatives of Wall Street and to fight for democracy rather than the corporate domination. Also, we've got to reprioritize our federal spending and investment on energy. And that means let's end these loan guarantees, tens of billions of dollars for nuclear power. We don't want nuclear power, we don't need it, and we need to shut it down. Also, we should recognize that the biggest institutional polluter on the planet is the U.S. military. And as the only candidate with experience in foreign policy in this race, I'm very well positioned to raise the coalitions necessary to challenge the Pentagon's pollutathon around the planet. Thanks very much. Is there anyone who could go to that tent? And